The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Young Engineers of Today. Um, I hope you're ready to continue with Fly to Learn. And otherwise, I hope you've had a good week. Um, we're going to, I suppose, continue with gliding. Uh, where did you guys leave off on Monday? Anybody, uh, anybody know about that? Anybody at all? <laughs> I'm assuming you guys at least did some of the flights since that's where we left off on Wednesday, but uh, alrighty then. Y'all are quiet today. All right, so, um, oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. But it was all part of gliding. Hmm. Okay. Let's um, let's review the glider lesson real quick. And if it rings a bell, then awesome. And if not, then when we hit the uh, when we hit the testing part, we can uh, we can decide where to go from there. Uh, and if uh, if you guys have already tested, then we'll go ahead and uh, we'll move on to the next lesson. So gliding. Um, gliders were the earliest form of unpowered fixed wing aircraft. Um, uh, aerospace engineers use gliders to gain an understanding of aerodynamics. Um, gliders rely on much of the same principles as the rest of aircraft design, but have to be altered in order to account for the fact that they've, they ain't got no engine or propulsion or nothing. Um, so they want to minimize weight. They want to minimize drag. They want to maximize lift. Um, they want to, you know, keep the edges nice and smooth and curved. Uh, they want to keep the wings as large as they possibly can. Um, there, there are a number of changes that are made. So let's see here, you've got an increased aspect ratio. So that's something that gliders take advantage of again. So you can have increased lift, um, also to reduce the amount of drag from that lift, uh, of course, there exists structural limits to the length of a wingspan. They, they can be too long um, just because there's too much material and the, the tensile strength of that material can't uh, hold up on the amount of weight that like the wings provide. So um, for that reason, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a feasible limit to a glider wingspan. Um, gliders are also, you know, a little bit less, uh, general purpose. Aircraft have a variety of uses. They're mostly used for travel, but like they, they have a lot of things that you can use them for. Gliders fly without power. Uh, so they're not suited for travel. They're, you know, not suited for combat. They're not suited for exploration. <laughs> They're, they're usually used uh, to get new pilots comfortable with aircraft controls, to uh, to do sightseeing, or just to do a neat-o thing that you don't necessarily need like a pilot's license for. Uh, in addition, uh, gliders also have a very malleable center of gravity. Uh, you can move the ballast around uh, in order to change its center of gravity, um, which can make them easier to fly. Gliders also do not have any means of increasing their altitude on their own, obviously, because they're not powered. How would you go back up into the air more? So for that reason, 
In order to start flying with a glider, you either got to be towed by an aircraft or you got to jump off a cliff. That that second one I meant literally. Some gliders are light enough that you can run well, like having it over your head, kind of like a hang glider kind of a thing. And uh, it's obviously not recommended because generally you you can't you need a really 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 high cliff in order to gain enough speed to recover and start gliding as opposed to just falling um so generally you don't see it as much as the powered aircraft towing but there are people who you know will go to the top of a cliff and uh hop in their glider and uh just either if it's got wheels push it down a hill off the edge of that cliff or if the glider is light enough uh, they can do like a hang glider thing where they run with it and then they sort of bring their legs up inside and, and uh, glide that way. Again, really depends upon the glider. Not always recommended. Additionally, if you want to increase the altitude of the glider while you're flying, you have to hit you know currents of hot air because those uh, because of convection and stuff like that will be shooting upwards because they'll want to go up. The cold air will want to fall. It will create a pressure system, which will push the hot air upwards into these channels um, so that it can cycle into the upper atmosphere and cool down and then fall. And it is the circle of uh, life insofar as, as air circulation is concerned. So you want to hop on one of those, one of those uh, hot currents that's going up so that it'll push the glider up into the air more, and then you can regain some altitude. All airplanes can function as gliders if their engines are turned off. However, powered airplanes are not nearly as good at it as gliders are because gliders are specifically built for it, whereas airplanes are not specifically built for it. In fact, they take some uh, concessions so that they aren't built like it. Um, glide, gliding performance is measured by a quantity known as glide ratio. A glide ratio of 30 to 1 means that it Anything that is gliding can travel 30 meters horizontally while only falling one meter. Most gliders today have ratios of 50 to 1, as compared to the 15 to 1 ratio most jet aircrafts flying today. So gliders can glide 50 feet for, or excuse me, meters for every one meter that they lose in altitude, as compared to uh, jet aircrafts, which can fly 15 horizontally for every one meter of height that they lose. So much, much more efficient at gliding. Gliders are, obviously. Powered aircraft also descend more quickly than gliders do their higher weight and consequently higher wing loading. So you can always um, figure out the uh, the glide ratio by uh, by figuring out the lift and the drag of a particular airplane. Because if you take the lift over the drag, if you divide it, and then you divide one by it, you'll have the tangent of the angle that is generated, which may not mean anything necessarily, but so if you've got a glide ratio of 50 to one, that means for every 50 feet you move laterally, excuse me, 50 meters you move laterally, you would lose one meter of altitude. That creates a triangle in and of itself. And what they're talking about here is the tangent of this angle, which is equal to 1 over the lift over the drag. So if we know the lift and the drag, we can divide 1 by it. We can get the tangent of the angle. If we take the reverse tangent of this, whatever the value is, we get the angle. So then we know how big the angle is here. And if we know how far we traveled here, we can also we can use that angle and then we can grab the um, We can grab like the cosine of the sine in order to, to uh, figure out what the uh, what the other uh, values are.
All righty. So did that sound familiar to anybody at all? I know I went through that pretty quickly, but is that, is that ringing a bell for anybody? No? Okay. All right, well, let's do some testing with this then. So I'll go ahead and get um, X-Plane started up and walk you guys through uh, what you got to do in order to, um, in order to uh, get this testing done. So let me... X-Plane... All right, so we've got the demo starting up. Hey, explain. Alrighty, so we're going to do our Cessna 172. As always, we're going to take off, well, we're not going to actually take off from Seattle Tacoma. We're going to do an approach on Seattle Tacoma, but we're going to use that one, as we always have. We're going to make it daytime and clear, as we always have. And we'll just go ahead and fly with those values and let it take forever to load. as we wait forever for it to load. La, 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 la. There we go. Hey, all right, pause. So, we're going to go up to settings and then data input and output. And we're going to want latitude, longitude, and altitude checked, the last two checkboxes, so line 20. And then we're going to want location, velocity, and distance traveled checked as well, so uh, 21. Then we're going to have lift over drag and coefficients. Uh, 
line 68, the last two checked there. And using this information, we're going to be able to calculate exactly our uh, words, our uh, lift over drag, or um, no, our uh, glide ratio. Jeez. All right. But that's not all. So once you've got these three sets of checkboxes checked, go ahead and close out. Go up to Location and select Global Airport because we're going to be taking the last three nautical mile approach into KSEA so on uh, 16. So select that first 3NM um, next to Runway 16. And make sure it's paused. Just go ahead and hit P. We're going to take advantage of the fact that we know our altitude right now. And we know our distance. So what we can do, our altitude isn't really actually going to help a whole lot. Um, because we're not going to land at zero. Our distance, however, is going to work wonders. Our distance and our lift over drag. So if we just hit down on the arrow key and basically kill the engine entirely, pull out the, the black lever as well as the red lever entirely, and that's going to kill our engines 100%. And we can verify this by if we unpause, we should hear the engines just die. And then just try and keep the, the plane as level as possible. So that is to say, your gimbal here, you want to keep that as level as possible until you land on the ground. Yeah, thanks. As you can see, that engine is very much dead. Not making any more forward thrust for us and just keep the airplane level and gliding. It'll say low vacuum and your gimbal will freak out a little bit. It still works. Not quite as well, but you know. And just keep an eye up here. As you can see, we've got a lift to drag of 33.07. Okay, okay, okay. Oh, come on. Nope, 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 nope. Even everything out. Let me fix this real quick. There we go. I've also totally uh, negated any experimental results, but that's okay. Pulling out just the um, just the black woo, lever should be enough. Why oh, got to be like that? I did. I don't think I moved the mouse. My lift over drag seems to be averaging about 32, 33. All right, and paused. So two and a half nautical miles, and it was about 32, 33. So then from there, um, let's say it's 33. One divided by 33, because our lift over drag ratio is just that value. 
which it says 25 right now, but it was about 33. 1 divided by 33 gives us 0 0.03030030. Blah, 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 blah. And what we're going to do is we are going to find the inverse tangent of that. It's going to be tan h, which doesn't actually do it. Tan d. Oh, okay, gotcha. All right, so 0 0.03030. 0 0 0 inverse tangent gives us an angle of about 1.7 degrees. Wow, that's really shallow. Not bad. All right, but 0.03030303. If we put that back in, tangent is actually meant to express a relationship. The tangent of an angle is equal to the opposite angle, or excuse me, the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Uh, wait, no, adjacent. She's... Can you tell I'm not 100% here? So it's the opposite side over the uh, adjacent side. So that is to say, if we were looking at a right triangle, if we want the tangent of this, what we're doing is we're describing the relationship of this side, which is the opposite, divided by this side, which is the adjacent. And if we know we've... traveled horizontally 2.5 nautical miles, then it's like saying opposite over 2.5. Now, if we multiply both sides by 2.5, we get the amount that it drops. So times 2.5, repeating, 0 0.075 repeating. So now our ratio is 0 0.075 repeating over 0 0.03 repeating. which is a weird ratio. I wonder if we can turn this into something that's a little bit easier to read. Um, times 10. Yeah, let's do that. So if we multiply both of these by 100, we get 75.8 over 3.0. Then we can divide both of them by 3, which gives us a glide ratio of about 25, roughly, for every 1. So based on all of that math there, uh, we found that the glide ratio is 25 to 1. So not too bad, not too terrible. Um, Cessnas are meant to be pretty pretty easy to fly. Now, granted, I also did kind of screw with my results by uh, by turning the engine back on for a second there in order to uh, to double check my uh, my leftover drag readings. But you guys, if you just kill the the black lever, you should have much more accurate results. So just take note of your lift over drag as you're sort of gently gliding towards the ground. Um, get your glide angle, get the distance traveled, which is the, should just be the distance traveled that you're given. And then from there you can calculate the glide ratio. So go ahead and do that a, a couple more times at least so that you have, you have three results. And then uh, when you're done with that, Go ahead and raise your hand and um, 
and then we'll move on to maybe the next lesson if we got time. Just as a reminder to raise your hand if you finished um, running the uh, the test flights. If you haven't, no problem, no rush. Just uh, just want to be sure. And we got one person already. Speeding through them. Two people. Two people.
How's everybody doing? Just, uh, if you're done, go ahead and raise your hand. I know I keep repeating myself, but I always want to remind everybody and make sure that we, uh, that you guys are, uh, a, all on the same page and B, it's probably not terribly exciting when you're done just to sort of sit there, even if maybe you are flying a little bit more. So I just want to make sure everybody's done so you're not, you're not all waiting on me. But it looks like we're still waiting on a couple more hands. So uh, we'll give it until 8.45 and then we will move on to just introduce the next lesson. That way, when you uh, when you talk to Mr. Dubik on Monday, you'll be able to go through that lesson and and do the test flying and stuff like that there too. So yeah, we'll uh, we'll pick it up again at eight forty five.
Hey, all right, so uh, looks like we're getting pretty close to 8.45 here, and just about every hand is up, so I think I'm going to call an audible here, and uh, we're going to move on to the next lesson a little bit earlier, um, which I realize not everybody's done yet, but that's okay. No worries. Uh, I think after a couple of attempts anyway, you guys get the point. So... We've already got that, and let's move on to jets versus propeller aircraft. So aircraft come in all different sizes, but every plane relies on one of two primary methods of propulsion, via jet engines or piston propeller engines. Piston propeller aircraft are distinguished by having at least one propeller, and jet planes generally have two or more jet engines. Makes sense. <laughs> performance of these aircraft is dramatically different, as you will soon find out. Further on in the section, you will find out why these planes have different characteristics. Okay, so that's that's pretty generic there. Um, piston prop aircraft are used for lower velocity flights and are not suited well for quick travel. Usually, general aviation aircraft, which are used for leisure but not for profit, utilize propellers. Propeller-driven aircraft are more affordable to average pilots, but do not perform as well as jets. These aircraft take longer to achieve higher altitudes and reach a mux much lower, excuse me, much lower maximum altitude than jets. They can, however, fly for longer amounts of time than a comparatively sized jet. On the other hand, jet aircraft are used for quickly traveling long distances. They can go super duper fast. Their engines produce thrust, which directly pushes them forward. Piston prop aircraft produce power to rotate the propeller, which then produces the plane, which then pushes the plane forward. So there's there's a bit of a loss there in the energy. Um, these aircraft are used commercially since they are more expensive to maintain. They can, however, ascend quickly and to higher altitudes where their engines work most effectively. Therefore, more fuel is used by these aircraft. So uh, they fly at a higher altitude than propeller airplanes do, and they need to in order to fly as efficiently as possible. Uh, they end up using more um, fuel in that case in order to, to go back up and down and, um, you know, just just because they... They go so fast and they use so much you know, fuel. Anyway, um, engineers often measure the performance of aircraft by determining their range and endurance. Uh, range is the maximum distance the aircraft can travel on a full tank of fuel, whereas endurance is the maximum time that an aircraft can fly on a full tank of fuel. So it's distance or time. Range is distance, endurance is time. However, these values do not necessarily occur at the same time. So both jets and propeller-driven aircraft, what you might be saying, uh, both jets and propeller-driven aircraft require specific conditions to maximize their range and endurance. One, they require an entirely full fuel tank. Obviously, the plane cannot fly as far if the tank is half full. They require a minimization of fuel use. Uh, this means that the aircraft must be flying in the way for which it was designed, be it the appropriate velocity, altitude, etc. Flight at a maximum lift to drag ratio. This ratio is found by dividing the lift by the drag. Higher numbers mean less drag, which is always desirable while in flight. And flight at ideal conditions, which vary for the two types of aircraft. So you've got to have a full tank. You've got to not be, you know, pedal to the metal the whole time. Uh, you got to fly, uh, you know, straight or slightly down, you know, not... Um, straight up into the sky or something like that and you got to fly in ideal conditions so good good weather um barometric pressure no turbulence crazy winds anything like that um <clears throat> propellers require a higher air density to run efficiently which occurs at lower altitudes their engines are similar to those found in a car um so they, they, you know, they require a higher air density in order to be able to facilitate the explosions that happen inside of the engine, as well as uh, push, you know, generate as much thrust as possible or as much forward um, power as possible with those propellers. Imagine, you know, uh, swimming through water versus trying to swim through air. Can't really do the latter because you don't really have enough to like sort of propel you forwards. In addition, you just kind of fall in the air. But in the water, you know, the medium is thick enough that you're able to sort of pull yourself forwards. Now, obviously, this is not a completely perfect analogy. Um, 
there are some flaws in it, but the idea is there. Um, anyway, jet aircraft fly more efficiently at higher altitudes since their engines were optimized to compress air at lower densities. As a result, propeller-driven aircraft fly at lower altitudes and lower speed, whereas jet aircraft fly best at higher altitudes with higher velocities. So these are also the ideal conditions that they're talking about as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. Should have muted myself before clearing my throat. Anyway, um, so yeah, propeller-driven aircraft um, rely on thicker, denser air in order to be able to pull themselves forward. Jet aircraft rely on thinner, less dense air um, in order to be able to compress it more so that they can shoot it out the back. So using X-Plane... You can easily see the differences in endurance of these two aircraft on a full fuel tank. Range, however, requires taking off on a full fuel tank and flying in level flight until the fuel runs out, which, you know, we could try on its own. Um, <clears throat> and then, you know, we can spend some time looking at that. Anyway, uh, if we were to take a look at um, take a look at the, the the fuel values here, you would see that despite having less fuel, the propeller-driven aircraft for, can fly for longer on one tank than the jet. Um, the numbers have no bearing on the diff, uh, efficiencies of these engines, though. To determine the efficiency of the engine, engineers use a quantity called specific fuel consumption, or SFC, for propeller-driven aircraft. Thrust-specific fuel consumption, or TSFC is the jet equivalent. This relates to the fuel consumed to the power, or in the case of jets, thrust produced by the aircraft's engine. These equations are then simplified for uh, simplified versions. Uh, these equations below are simplified versions for determining these numbers. So, propeller-specific fuel consumption is um, uh, the pounds of fuel divided by horsepower times time. So, the horsepower being the power of the engine times the time. Uh, which is the uh, the amount of time, basically, <clears throat> however long it it takes in order to use up that fuel. Same idea with the jet thrust specific fuel consumption, except it's thrust instead of horsepower. So using the equations for SFC and TSFC above, uh, calculate the the SFC of the Cessna 172 and the TSFC of the Cirrus the jet. Um, based on the number of hours the jet can fly with maximum fuel and the number of hours the, the uh, Cessna can fly with maximum fuel. And that's something that, <clears throat> after taking a look at it on Monday, uh, you guys can you guys can uh, do the calculations with Mr. Dubik. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and, and call it for today, uh, since it is 8.52. Uh, we'll do the poll questions, and then we'll leave it open for question and answer time. Um, so on Monday, you guys will probably start out with the with the uh, looking at the number of hours for fuel um, for the Cirrus and the Cessna. Anyway, uh, we'll do the poll questions. If you have any questions about anything uh, after the poll questions are done, I'm here. Otherwise, you're more than welcome to head out and have a wonderful weekend. <laughs>